Welcome to All Music Matters in That, a podcast for all things related to music. If you're new to the channel, make sure you like and comment below and consider subscribing so you can show your support and join today so you can see more content like this in the future. And now, let's get into the episode. Uh, getting yourself out there, jams, just getting yourself out there in social media and waiting for the shows to come to you. Because with me, it was probably two or three years of just going out and jamming with people before I was getting you know, steadily booked for my own stuff. So it's definitely just a thing of patience and a thing of not expecting the instantaneous, you know, start gigging because there's been, there's people who've been doing it for 30 years who are looking for the same gigs as you. So you kind of just have to have the passion for it to where you want to play music, not just you want to, you know, play music out because you can't get one without the other. Hey everyone, welcome to All Music Matters in That Podcast. I'm your host, Brian, and joining me today is my guest, Pierce. Is it Dipner? Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, yes. Name? Yeah, Dipner. Cool. And you're a musician in and around Pittsburgh, and it looks like you delve into blues music, right? Is that what you do? Uh, yeah, mostly blues, blues rock kind of stuff. Not really. You're actually pretty, you're still pretty young. Did you say like you're like 19 or something, or like how old are you right now? I'm 18. You're 18? Mm hmm. That's pretty cool. I guess everything's a little hard with school and also like doing all the touring and everything as well. Yeah, it can be, uh, can kind of be a little bit, uh, much when I have like shows on the weekdays that I'm not getting home till one oh, stuff man. with homework. But, uh, most of my teachers, uh, know what I do and they're normally pretty fine if there's something coming up with it. And I know with going to Memphis in May, they're all pretty encouraging of that. Oh, uh, you're going all the way to Memphis. That's stuff. awesome, man. Yeah. I'm going to be down there for the, uh, international blues challenge. My band won uh, best band in Western Pennsylvania, so we're representing them down there. Awesome, that's sweet. All right, so uh, the reason I reached out to you, number one, I actually saw a little ad on Facebook, and I think it said you were going to play at Moon Dogs. I think it's a mm -hmm. little uh, bar and pub in uh, Blonox, PA. Yeah, that's where I found you out. I just wanted to reach out because this podcast I just launched this year, and I wanted to also get to know musicians and then, like get to know them personally and like how they got into music and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So. Just got some questions for you, so just for the audience out there, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your style of play. Yeah, well, I'm a uh, my band and uh, myself when I perform are mostly, you know, like I said, blues, rock, uh, some soul kind of stuff. I started out playing pretty young in Pittsburgh. I think my first professional gigs where I was just getting, you know, hired and playing out was when I was like 13. Uh, and coming up in Pittsburgh, it's always a great blues community, as I'm sure. Uh, anyone involved with it would know they're really supportive, um, that kind of stuff. I've been able to do a lot of great stuff so far uh, in my short career and being a young musician. I've been able to go to some festivals all around the country, uh, up in Canada, and even outside of blues, uh, music is you know taking me to Europe. I've done uh, a European tour with the Pittsburgh Youth Philharmonic Orchestra playing cello, which is always a pretty interesting experience especially kind of putting that next to you know playing out with blues and playing out with classical music it's kind of cool to see the different stuff that you can do out there uh, who got you into music was it uh one of your parents or did it, was it just something you just picked up one day um well i know my my family's always been really uh big on music it was pretty much always on whether it's just listening to you know local radio stations like yep pretty much all the time or i mean my both my parents are huge music fans from as long as they can remember, just kind of always growing up in an environment with great music and lots of different genres on, sort of got me into a lot of different stuff that I'd say a lot of people were into at my age, so kind of credit them. Was it like the classic rock and stuff, like the Black Sabbath, Kiss, Alice Cooper, that kind of music too, and then uh, some of the blues, like uh, Billy Price and stuff like that? Yeah, I know, especially with some of the... Uh, well, pretty much every genre, honestly, my parents would listen to, so I always got a good taste of everything. Uh, but a lot of classic rock, uh, blues stuff for my dad, and also local musicians, like you were saying, like Billy Price, Norman Nardini, Joe Grishecki were all guys that my, my dad would go and check out when he was growing up. It's been pretty cool to meet a lot of those guys and you know see them and have the guys that my parents were growing up with now me uh, playing the same festivals as them and my parents uh, 
you know, being able to share that with me and now me hearing their music. So, did you ever meet Jimmy Adler? Oh yeah, me and uh, Jimmy have been good friends for a while. He was probably one of the first blues musicians who was helping me out a lot because the first time I went to Memphis as a youth representative in the International Blues Challenge, his band was going down. Uh, so we got to go, we got to get together and kind of do some pre-Memphis stuff. He would help me out there and. Uh, we actually got to do some radio appearances together with me, uh, him and Charlie Barath went on YP uh, to, you know, play a song together on the like live and highlight what we were going down to do. I got to do some uh, TV appearances with Charlie Barath, also WDV, uh, and both of those were in the morning. So it was kind of tough for Jimmy because he's also a teacher. Uh, but, you know, yeah, he's been really supportive. One of my favorites in the area. Yeah, Jimmy's a real good guy. Uh, mm-hmm. He actually took some time out to come celebrate. A friend of my dad's at his birthday party there, he just played on the back porch and uh, mm-hmm. just jamming and everything. I know I was just taking pictures and everything and shooting videos. It was awesome, man. He's really a down-to-earth kind of guy, too, so I hope to have yeah. him on here one day. So, uh, What made you want to pick up guitar? Did you kind of jump around a little bit, or did you just go straight for the guitar? Um, honestly, it started off with just when I was – so I live in Mount Lebanon and there's a uh, music store in Mount Lebanon called Empire Music. Mm. When I was in like kindergarten or something, whenever I was like five years old, they had a summer class that was a couple weeks where they'd give you like a little starter guitar and teach you a couple songs uh, for like two weeks. I did that and never really continued after that. But when I was eight, I found the guitar in my closet, uh, looked up how to tune it and just started kind of messing around with it. Uh, my parents got me private lessons and I started from there and pretty much the same time around like eight or nine. I also picked up cello uh, through the school and uh, started playing drums. So kind of everything sort of started at once and I got a lot of, you know, musical experiences starting out pretty young. Uh, for cello, did you like play any of like the rock songs? Because I, I was also a former cello player too and, mm. and unfortunately became a lost star after I went to college and everything. Mm. And, I felt bad because I had to sell it later on. But uh, did you play like any, some of like the, I say toe down versions of like Stairway to Heaven, Bohemian Rhapsody? Did you guys ever do something like that? Uh, actually, when I was in, I think it was elementary school, there was a guy named Mark Wood who makes these like uh, electric violins and cellos who came and did a performance with our school orchestra where he did a bunch of classic rock songs. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. I know we did. I think we did like Thunderstruck and, you know, uh, Crazy Train and all that stuff with him up there with an electrified violin and a wireless system running around all the kids playing, but all that. And also every music teacher I had would always show everyone, you know, uh, I'm not sure if you heard of them, two cellos, those guys who do all those, uh, they kind of do their own arrangements of rock songs. Uh, it doesn't really ring a bell, but uh, are they, can you elaborate a little bit more on them? Yeah, they're, they're just these... Um, well, as, as their name would suggest, just two cello players who rearrange uh, classic rock and pop songs to be uh, all the melodies done on cello. Mm. And uh, they're they're great. They do a lot of cool performances like that. I know they travel all around the world and stuff like that. So music teachers would always show that to all the kids to say, you know, if you don't think the music necessarily that we're playing is fun, there's always something else to do. Mm. Uh, if you like an instrument, don't think that you're tied down to what that instrument's associated with. I mean, even going like that, there's a uh, blues violinist that I know from uh, Boston named Alana Katz Katz. And, um, you know, she's great at what she does. And most people don't expect uh, violin solos on blues songs, but she seems to really have it nailed down and know what she's doing. Well, they actually did use a violin in uh, The Who's famous song, the Babbo O'Reilly song. Yeah. And it, it took me forever just to realize like that was the instrument the whole time. I was always like, what kind of instrument is that? And mm-hmm. when I saw him play live, when it came down to Pittsburgh at the PBG Paints, that's when it was the last song. And then that's when they brought the violin and everything. I was like, oh, that makes sense. So, yeah. Uh, funny question, though. Did somebody yell all aboard, you know, if you did Crazy Train <laughs> and how the intro goes? Did somebody yell? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't remember. I'm sure no one... Uh, his personality, he was probably yelling it, but can't remember that much from uh, yeah. back then. Yeah. Well, that's good to reminisce every now and again. Uh, what mm-hmm. kind of brand is your guitar? Um, well, the ones mostly what I play out is a uh, Fender Stratocaster, Gibson 335, and a Les Paul, Gibson Les Paul. Uh, I have 
a lot more guitars than just those. And I mean, you know, you can't play them all out all the time, but those are kind of the three main ones that I find myself playing out uh, mm -hmm. more than other ones. When it comes to acoustics, I have a, uh, I play Taylor acoustics mm -hmm. and um, I actually just picked up a pretty interesting acoustic uh, made by recording King, which is a relatively inexpensive brand, but it's a um, signature guitar for Justin Towns Earl, who is a uh, kind of like a, folk americana guy um who you know probably is one of my favorite songwriters of all time uh he recently passed away and they were making the, they're working with him to make a, a signature guitar and now all the proceeds from that guitar or not all the proceeds but a portion of them are going to go towards uh his wife and daughter and you know trying to help them out so i picked that guitar up and it's only like a 300 hundred dollar guitar but it plays and sounds like something that could be worth like a thousand dollars at least so that's good charity right there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I think you already said how you got into like the blues and rock because that was like something that incorporated from all the music you and your mm -hmm. parents were listening to too. Uh, would you say there's like a favorite uh, musician you would consider your favorite and you still listen to this day? Um, honestly, with everything I listen to, it's kind of tough to pinpoint a favorite. I know that when I think back to musicians who I was listening to a lot when I was first getting into, you know, uh, playing guitar in the way that I play it now and getting into this style of music, probably the musician that sort of bridged the gap between rock and blues and that I credit a lot with uh, helping me to form my style would be Gary Clark Jr. Mm. Uh, mainly because he, you know, does his, he does some like harder psychedelic rock stuff on like his cover of uh, Come Together. And then he also does like, complete just straight up soul all the way to like now he's doing things with like elements of hip hop in it, but he has a pretty wide range. But when I was listening to him and most of the stuff he was putting out when I was starting guitar was, you know, blues inspired rock, which kind of showed me that blues can be whatever you make it because there's so much room to kind of add your own touch to it. So I would, I don't know if I could say a favorite musician. He's definitely one of my favorites, but also probably the most important in bridging the gap to what I do now. That's pretty sweet. Uh, going into the band, like, uh, how'd you form your current band right now? Uh, my current band now is just, I've, I've always had the same drummer, uh, because you know, he's a great drummer, but he's also a pretty easy, uh, choice. Cause he's also my cousin. Mm. Uh, his name's Kevin Hines and he's a very well established, like Pittsburgh jazz drummer. Uh, I know he's toured with Donovan Frankenreiter opening for Jack Johnson. Uh, he's played New Orleans Jazz Festival, Coachella, stuff like that. So he has a lot of uh, experience, but it's also a um, you know, family member who I knew was a great drummer, so I went straight for him. And uh, my current bass player, Arnold Stagger, has been with me for, I believe, like probably – two or three years now it's kind of hard to pinpoint because of uh covid and mm -hmm. everything feels like it's been way shorter than it actually has been oh yeah because we were out of playing music for so long but um i i was looking for a new bass player to fill in and some to fill in on some gigs where my previous bass player couldn't make it and he started filling in and eventually it was just uh he was my go-to bass player because mm. he's i mean he's a he's been doing this in pittsburgh forever uh, a lot of people speak very highly of him so knew he would be a good candidate i was gonna say did you jump around a little bit like did you jump between bass players and maybe drummers before you settled on both these guys uh not with not with drummers he was my drummer was my first uh choice for this and he's been here the whole time with i've only had two bass players uh i think whenever i've had anyone both my bass players have been you know we're both great musicians and uh great to work with so it's pretty easy once they I knew that they were already guys that I'd want to work with whenever they said they would do it I was stuck with them and didn't find any uh, issue with what they were doing so I don't I didn't really jump around too much just uh glad to have access to musicians who would be able to just jump right in and stay yeah I would say that's always been like the hard part with like bands is like mm -hmm. having a sort of consistency at times because of yeah whether it be like creative differences have you guys ever run into like any sort of issues with like creativity or personal issues or something like that uh surprisingly we've all gotten along very well um i think that 
me being a younger musician, it's really good to have these musicians who aren't just doing it, you know, for, for, uh, just to make money, just to be in a band, but they both, you know, kind of want to help me out and show me what, uh, what they know and pass on what they've learned over the years. And, uh, they're both, you know, great guys who I get along with well when it comes to pretty much anything creative. We, whenever we're rehearsing and stuff, we always find like new things to do and stuff like that. So uh, I've never really had any issues with them. They've always been really supportive of what I'm trying to do and also really uh, important in helping me form the current sound that I, that I'm playing. That's really good. And that's what my dad always taught me to like, don't make any mm-hmm. drama or stuff like that. Just to always try to find like a good middle. So yeah. Is, is that what you also try to do? You just try to say, guys, let's just do this for fun. And let's just, keep it in the family or something like that i guess mm. try to keep it right in the middle as they would say but uh let's jump into COVID a little bit so let's see 2020 you've been around 16 at that time right yeah so i guess how did COVID like hamper your i guess music career at that point uh it was initially it was kind of tough because uh, the summer, I know that our last gig we played, I still remember, was uh, March 13th that year. Uh, it was it was kind of weird because it was the day that they were announcing that, like, you know, there's cases all over the country. They think it's going to end up being pretty bad. So on the drive out to the gig, like, all the highways seemed empty, and it was like a Saturday night because this was still the time when everyone thought it was going to be, like, a, you know, crazy apocalypse. Everyone was buying up toilet paper and everything. So people were kind of scared to leave the house. Uh not knowing what was going on, but we went out to the gig. It was surprisingly a pretty packed place, a really fun gig. And it was, I was glad to end it on something I enjoyed, but I was never expecting it to go as far as it did with uh, how long we'd be out of live music. Cause initially it was, you know, two weeks here, two weeks there. It ends up being like two years Mm -hmm. almost. I mean, with music, it kind of came back before then, but to the extent that it was, I don't even know if it's fully come back. Sometimes you see shades of it, but um, we had a lot of stuff booked for the summer, some stuff out of state that we were pretty excited for, uh, a lot of festivals that got canceled. And looking back on it, I think that even though I was very upset that a lot of stuff got canceled and of course we missed out, I think it gave me time to, you know, take a step back and start writing uh, some more music, which is when I started working on the album. Uh, we would work on it whenever cases were down to where we could all come to the studio and everything because some of the guys recording on it didn't live in Pennsylvania and then have to take a couple months off, wait for it to calm down again and get back in. So had a lot of time to think about the album, what we were doing. So I, I see it as kind of a bad situation that a good thing for myself and some other musicians probably came out of with having some time to step back. But also, I mean... I was pretty lucky being a young musician who, you know, is still in high school with his parents and doesn't rely on music for, for my full income. Yeah. Because I saw, I saw a lot of musicians who I know who do full tours. They're, you know, really well known in the blues scene and they were having to take second jobs because they didn't really have anything saved up. Cause from what I understand for a lot of people touring and that kind of stuff, isn't really a way of making a ton of money, being able to save it. It's making enough money to keep touring. Yeah. Which, you know, is kind of I, I don't see that as something bad or something that you should look at and be don't go for music because I'm going to be trying to do the same thing. But uh, it definitely put something in my mind that it might be that when things are uncertain, it can be kind of tough to be a musician. But yeah, you know, I guess as we're slowly trying to claw our way out of the, out of the Omicron variant because we got. First hit with the regular, we'll just say regular COVID, because they didn't really give a name for it. Then they gave mm. Delta, now Omicron. Looks like they got Omicron 2.0 slowly yeah. coming out or something like that. I guess, what's your plans to kind of, I guess, accelerate your career and like say, like, this is what I want to do. And this is the path I chose. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just, right now, I'm focusing on getting as much stuff booked as I can. Uh, and kind of looking out in the future is, you know, if it goes well. I don't really see it ever getting back to a point of like lockdown again uh i know that there'll be you know times where we have more cases than we did a couple months ago or it'll go up or down but i feel like with with um 
majority of people getting, you know, their vaccine and everything, it seems like people aren't having as serious of cases and things are kind of getting back to normal. So uh, unless some new variant comes out that's, you know, just bypasses all that, I don't really see it as locking down again. But uh, I'm just trying to get as much stuff booked as I can and keep on going with music. I know next year I'll be starting in college and also pursuing music. I'll be staying in Pittsburgh, so I'll have my band and everything, but I'm going to work on that. I'm not necessarily sure what's going to come from that, but once again from COVID, I'm seeing it as like I might need something else financially if I really want to pursue music to the full extent, so I have the ability to take a step back if I need to, if, you know, gigging dries up, but uh, just trying to live with what's going on and uh, book as much as I can, play as much as I can, uh, stuff like that. That's awesome. Are you uh, just saying you're staying local? So you're going to like CCAC, Point Park, Duquesne, one of those schools, or is it more higher end ones? Um, well, I'm actually going to be doing my first either one or two years at CCAC because, you know, just financially it's way, way less expensive. Uh, but I will be doing, uh, Right now, what I think I'm doing is a degree that has an articulation agreement with Pitt. So it'll be, you know, as long as I maintain a, like, I think it's like a two-something GPA, you'll automatically transfer to Pitt. Uh, so okay. that's not, but, you know, with CCAC, it's like going to be $3,000 a year for me or something. Oh, really? uh, so it'll be relatively inexpensive. And uh, also I have more time to focus on music when it's kind of just taking classes that necessarily doesn't have to be a full college life and college experience and, you know, living in dorms or commuting as much because I can go to, you know, CCAC main campus or South campus and, you know, stuff like that, where it'll be a little bit uh, more accessible to play music. Yeah, absolutely. And it'd be close to home too. So you won't have Mm -hmm. to worry about doing long drives and stuff like that. Yeah, because I wouldn't have anywhere to keep, you know, a PA system, amps, all that stuff. I'm living in a dorm room. <laughs> They'd be so. coming to knock on your door and everything. Yeah. Neighbors will be all upset and everything. Uh, when it comes to touring, I, I know I've seen, like, some videos where, like, musicians will say, like, it's always good to, like, go out there and play for the fans and stuff, but there's, like, always some sort of stress involved with it or maybe physical labor. I guess what's been the biggest trouble with touring that from your experience? Well, um, so far I've never had to the extent of like a, you know, full tour, like a lot of people are doing, or like you probably assume when you hear tour, I've played festivals all over the country and in Canada and stuff like that, but I've never gone like, you know, three months on the road. So I'm not sure if I can speak to that. I know with traveling, uh, the main issue that I've found is just, um, the matter of, honestly, the, the main issue I've ever found with going out of state and playing is just making sure that you're all set before you leave, not forgetting anything. And then also trying to coordinate, you know, arrivals with a lot of on a long drive where a lot of things could go bad. Mm -hmm. I know, especially with uh, going down South in the winter, whenever I've done that, um, it seems like a lot of the times I'm on the road, there's, you know, blizzards and everything like that. And in some Southern States, they're not as equipped to handle, you know, a, like what would be seen as a small amount of snow here could kind of really mess up driving conditions uh, and other places that aren't as prepared for it. And I've, I've known, especially with going to Memphis for the international blues challenge, there's been musicians coming from, you know, Washington or Maine on pretty much the farthest ends of the country from where they're going that have to drive, you know, 20 something uh, hours to get here and uh, drive through a blizzard the whole way. So I'd say that most times whenever I'm playing a festival or something uh, out of state, it's always set up way before all the staff is great and they make sure you understand everything. It's just kind of the uncertainty of the travel itself is the only thing I've had issues with. Hmm. And you said you've been to Europe a couple of times. Uh, is that just more of the jet lag just coming off the plane too? or? Yeah, I've been to, when I went to Europe, it was with a whole orchestra on a plane for a, for the Pittsburgh Youth Philharmonics hmm. tour they did there. And no real issues there because pretty much everything was handled for us. Uh, we rented instruments when we were there, so we didn't have to worry about, you know, carrying that. I'm sure if we brought our own, some people would be coming off the plane with a cracked cello or like their bridge fell off or something. But um, 
No, yeah, definitely the only issue there was jet lag and trying to get a hundred or something kids together on a bus or on a couple buses and leaving at the right time. No, oh, really. Uh, do you have like any sort of funny memories or I guess anything from touring or any sort of festivals you've been to? Any sort of funny memories you like to share? Um, with music, like with blues music, probably the funny ones would just be honestly people who you encounter when you're running around Memphis at like two in the morning and you're trying to cut through alleyways to get to a certain bar in time and uh, stuff like that. I know that one funny one that I actually was a little nervous about when it was happening was uh, we were a good bit off the beaten path in Memphis uh, going to an abandoned church to see some international performers do a showcase there. And this, uh, this group of like younger guys like runs up to us out of an alley and they're all wearing like ski masks and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, well, oh this looks, this looks bad. Yeah. But it, it actually was just some, uh, it was pretty cold in Memphis. So you can kind of understand that. But initially we were a little nervous cause they warned us about crime in the area, but, um, it was actually just some young kids who were trying to sing for us, which was <laughs> a little, it was definitely a relief, but that I was nervous for a little bit. And, uh, in terms of the orchestra side, when we were getting ready, or actually this wasn't necessarily a tour, but um, at a summer practice or something, I, I, I think it was, if you were in the orchestra, you were going, and then there were also kids from just other schools who would who would show up and take like a summer camp there that was run by the orchestra that I was in. Uh, someone found a way to put a bassoon through the back of a cello and out the front, because it like got, it hit a doorway fell out of the guy's hand and went straight through the cello of the person behind him. So, oh, man. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's always something, but mm -hmm. normally the most of them involve like somebody who was like drunk or coming out of the way. Oh yeah. There's been a ton of those just playing pretty much any, I don't even, I can't pinpoint it to certain places more than anything else. I've had people, you know, jump up on stage and grab the microphone during a break and start screaming into it or singing. I've had people try to grab my guitar off of me while I was playing uh, stuff like that. Guys who insist on sitting in on a song during the set, like screaming about how they want to play the drums with you, uh, all that stuff. But I mean, you kind of take it as it comes. It's just a matter of, you know, playing out for the public. You're going to be around the public and the public is never going to be, you know, all perfect. It'll be, you know, just a culmination of different people doing different things. So some, some crazy stuff happens sometimes, but it's always, whenever it's over you're thinking back like that was pretty funny that's a good memory to have it's all good fun yeah yeah did they ever do something like crowd surfing or they come up and just want to like give you a big hug and stuff like that um i've never necessarily had a crowd big enough for crowd surfing no uh with you know with blues festivals most of the time it's a lot of people spread out and uh, stuff chairs, like that yeah, chairs, yeah a lot of people sitting down um i have had people like come up and randomly just like give me a hug when i was playing i've had someone try to like give me a kiss on the cheek and of course these are all like relatively older people which is <laughs> always pretty funny but i mean because you know i'm a younger musician they kind of see me as like a you know i've heard, had a lot of people refer to themselves as like my blues grandma or grandpa you know it's like they're just supportive older people who love the music and love to see someone who's younger uh doing it so it's always taken as a compliment when someone's enjoying the music and uh, is saying something like that, like that uh, they're proud to see a young person playing the music they love. That's pretty sweet. Uh, we're actually down to the last couple of questions. So mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that you want to talk about specifically? Do you have like any sort of questions you want to ask me too? Hmm. Like, uh, like the stuff that I'm doing or like stuff that would be just stuff about your podcast or something. Anything that really comes to mind, but if you want to ask about the podcast, shoot away. Yeah, I guess uh, what started you with doing the podcast? Well, it was it was always put on like the back burner. I meant to kind of start like last year, but working two jobs and stuff like that, it's mm -hmm. it got a little tricky at times. But this year, I decided I wasn't going to put any barriers up. In fact, because of what Omicron and all the other variants of COVID have done, it's kind of kept me confined within my house and everything. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just saying like, no more. I'm sick of COVID, so to speak. 
I'm going to go out. I'm going to enjoy some shows. I'm also going to do a podcast because I want to get back to interact with people. Because really, when I was confined in here, I didn't really get to interact with a whole lot of people. It started to change a little bit after getting vaccinated and everything. So mm-hmm. this one, I just wanted to get out and talk with musicians. I saw yours, and it was just one of those opportunistic kind of moments. So I just mm-hmm. wanted to say, like, you know, this guy is in around Pittsburgh, too. So we're both here. So why don't we just kind of talk about it and just share basically our passions for music and it also helps us get to know each other a little bit personally too so yeah stuff like that do you have like anything else you want to ask or anything else that comes to mind hmm. um so i didn't really think too much of questions before this i was uh this is actually the first time i've ever gotten to ask a question on a podcast or radio which i'm kind of it's kind of interesting well, but, um, well, it's meant to be differentiating, and yeah, I no, wanted to I like try it. to give a little freedom too. So I wanted to. Yeah, I know it's kind of on the spot. So if you just want to take a moment, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess who would you say was probably one of the more interesting musicians you've interviewed so far? Well, it's been kind of limited to just uh, mainly drummers who are on YouTube, uh, like a mm-hmm. small presence and stuff like that. Yeah. So far, it's actually been you because you're actually the first musician you know, and guitar and like a big member the front man of a blues group yeah uh, a couple other ones have been like drummers who have i've done collaborations with and stuff like that who've mm-hmm. got a mid to a somewhat higher presence on youtube and social media and stuff like that that's really about it so far and i'm hoping to at least expand i know i've reached out to a couple of studios i reached out to one it was the uh, mr small's uh mm-hmm. production studio over here in Pittsburgh, and then there was one way down south, all the way in Florida. It was actually west of Tampa Bay in uh, Largo, Florida, called Lycan Sound Productions. Still kind of in the, talking about them, but yeah, this is still relatively new. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I do want to at least get to people who have maybe a little higher status, celebrities and stuff like that. But we're still working there, so it's yeah, definitely. Okay, I guess we got one more or. You want me to jump to the last question? Um, I'm not too sure. I'd probably say just last question. All right. So the last question for you. Uh, what sort of message would you give to musicians who are perhaps looking to take a similar path that you did? Something like hopeful, like a hopeful message that they could take from mm. this. Um, well, I guess first off, I was probably talking to a younger musician uh, starting off. I mean, even in, in blues, younger is kind of a relative term uh, because – it's not necessarily every day you see someone even in their 20s uh, doing this kind of stuff. But I mean, if it's the music you like, if it's, you know, something that you're passionate about, uh, I'd say blues is probably one of the best communities for starting musicians. Just head out to whatever blues jams are in your area. Try to find any blues groups like uh, maybe a blues society around you. See what's going on. Figure out who the, you know, local musicians who you see gigging out a lot are. Try to meet them uh, and Honestly, it'll kind of all just snowball from there, especially with this kind of music, because it's kind of a very supportive, uh, new musician friendly, uh, jam oriented sort of thing. So there's always an opportunity for you to get out there and meet some new musicians, play with some new musicians, stuff like that. And uh, just also a big part of it would be try to have a good social media presence, uh, even if you're you don't think that you have enough followers or you're getting enough likes or something like that, still share everything you're doing because it it kind of catalogs everything you're doing. So whenever people do look at it, there's stuff on there because you know, you, you never know who's going to see you performing stuff like that. And honestly try out for anything around you, like your local blues challenge, stuff like that. Uh, Talk to the local blues societies about youth opportunities because I know that we don't have a tryout for, for our youth representatives in Western Pennsylvania, they just elect somebody. And uh, when I was first given that opportunity, all I was doing before that was playing at jams. Mm. Um, And they just knew me from Blue Society hosted jams. And they said, you know, we're going to give this kid a chance to go down to Memphis and meet some, some musicians down there. And that kind of pushed me in the right direction, stuff like that. So it's definitely just a game of meeting people and, and making as many connections as you can and just, uh, for, I guess, musicians in general, it's pretty much just about not giving up on it because you're going to start off with 
you know, feeling like you're you're not playing as many shows, you're not doing uh, as much as you wish you could. But it's kind of a matter of uh, getting yourself out there at jams, just getting yourself out there in social media and waiting for the shows to come to you. Because with me, it was probably two or three years of just going out and jamming with people before I was getting, you know, steadily booked for my own stuff. So it's definitely just a thing of patience and a thing of not expecting the instantaneous, you know, start gigging because there's been there's people who've been doing it for 30 years who are looking for the same gigs as you so you kind of just have to have the passion for it to where you want to play music not just you want to you know play music out because you can't get one without the other Hmm. Uh, you need to just focus on honing your craft practicing as much as you can improving and focus on you know making yourself known and eventually it'll all kind of just come together Awesome. Well, let me just see. Was that really all of them? I actually did miss one, but uh, what uh, brand was your pick? Just a uh, last thing to close out the episode here. Is that uh, a specific my, brand or my picks that I use? Um, honestly, I have collected like so many just random picks that I I don't necessarily even buy them anymore i just kind of find them i don't i can't even remember the last time i've bought guitar picks uh i just have like a bag of picks that i bring to me or bring with me to every show that i just throw in another bag with some gear in it uh and a bowl full of picks like in my basement where i practice it's just i kind of reach in grab a handful feel them and whatever feels right i'll just play with normally i like Mm. i know that i like like uh at least heavy picks um sort of like from 0.88 millimeters up and i mean of course not not too heavy but just kind of like the standard uh heavy pick size it's about a standard uh pick cut as well not like you know jazz picks or anything like that just you know the basic uh stuff like that is all i really need and what i'm most comfortable with yeah throw them out in the crowd when you're all done with the shows afterwards uh no i don't i, I would i would eventually want to do that i mean i know some guys who do that especially um a lot of blues guys do that where they'll have the custom picks that they'll throw. When I went and saw um, the Allman Betts band, yeah. they were probably every other song like throwing a handful out because they're they're sponsored by a pick company to where they, they're kind of not required to, but they get a couple hundred for each show. So mm. they're just, I've actually been able to collect a lot of picks from bands that I've seen and musicians I've met, which is kind of a cool thing that I've not necessarily ever tried to collect them. They've just sort of built up with uh you know the custom picks with the guy's name on it or something like that all right that's pretty cool all right pierce well i want to thank you so much for coming on my podcast this has actually been the shortest one because a lot of my other episodes they've gone from like 50 minutes to like over an hour at times Mm -hmm. so this one's this actually has been the shortest one so far so i do want to thank you so much again for coming on my podcast and everything uh yeah where are you uh touring next or i guess where's your next shows at um the burke yeah, we're going to be playing throughout Pittsburgh up until May. And we'll be going down to the International Blues Challenge uh, in Memphis to compete there. And then after that, uh, I have some stuff booked throughout the summer around here with local festivals and stuff uh, that I'll be doing. I'm not, I didn't really book too much in advance for the start of the fall because I'm not, I wasn't sure what I'd be doing with, with college and everything and mm. trying to get all that sorted out. But I'll be trying to pick it up as much as I can uh around that time and booking for summer next year and everything like that but uh right now i have a bunch of shows coming up in pittsburgh and around western pennsylvania i think west virginia stuff like that so pretty much anything within like an hour and a half of here will probably be coming your way at some point uh you can find all my upcoming events on my website piercedipner.com so if you want to check those out you can uh still like that I will say this. I will pay big money if you ever destroy a guitar one of these days. Just take it over and just bam. I'll do like the Pete Townsend kind of stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, Pierce, thank you again so much for coming on. And all the viewers out there, make sure you go and check this guy mm-hmm. out. So, Pierce, yeah, thank stay, you. stay safe and stay tuned. Yeah, thank you for having me on. No worries. Take care. Yep.